So for the rest of us, we're on page 15 of the, of the, of the text, Jesus in Jerusalem. Okay? So, so just as we start this story, there are two things about the connection of exactly where we are that I want us to think about. The first is, is the location. Because if this is exactly where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived, we are where Jesus is in the story, exactly. And that road just out there, right? Sis, uh, I keep going to call her Sister Martha. Mother Mary described it as, as the road between Bethphage, Bethany and Jerusalem, which is exactly how, how Mark described it. That's how it was known. And it, and it means that Jesus walk that very road probably you know if those are the stones those are the stones that Jesus walked on so we are here and we're in Bethany which is where Jesus comes at the beginning of the last week of his life and this is where he hides out that's the first thing the second connection is we've just heard what it might mean when Jesus says in his context of occupation you have heard it said. You have heard it said, "Love your enemy, love your love your friends, and hate your enemies." But I tell you, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. You know that is explosive stuff under the context of occupation, and it just sounds and feels like something completely different from here's a spiritual principle for anyone in any place why don't you just all love your enemies and wouldn't it be a wonderful world do you know what I mean yeah. that that element of confrontation and and um, and resistance it's always been said long before Empire studies started to uncover the elements of conflict and how confrontational what uh, G uh, how confrontational Jesus was and how radical the call to discipleship is that, that he makes. Long before then, it was always recognized that, that the biggest issue or problem in Christology, which is what you believe about Jesus, how do you account for the fact that Jesus ends up on a Roman cross? I mean, number one, why a Roman cross? There were lots of interesting ways of dying in the time of Jesus. You know, you could be strangled, you could be disemboweled, you could be John the Baptist and have your head cut off, you could be flogged to death. I mean, why a Roman cross? And Jesus, at, you'll remember, halfway through the Gospel at Caesarea Philippi says, discipleship is about denying yourself, taking up your cross. He didn't just say, I'm going to die. He said, I'm going to die on a cross. Why? There's that question uh, about about why the cross and, and and secondly why kill mr nice guy it was carl bart who 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 had obviously attended urc services before they were who who said about liberal protestantism why on earth would anyone bother killing jesus he said after listening to all these sermons and and you know i often find that you sit in church and you think yeah jesus is a guy you want at your garden party or you want your sister to bring home and say hey look who i've met um and 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 yet yet they crucify this guy so so those questions about why the cross the second set of questions that we need to ask always i i think is how does this make sense of the story of jesus that we're told in the lead up to it and how does it make sense to our faith when we are told that what happens to Jesus on that cross has got something to do, in fact, is, has got everything to do with the fact that, the, that God is saving the world or God saves the world through this? How, how does it make sense of the story? How does it make sense of our faith that this is a salvation story, not a story of martyrdom? You get the difference. A martyr dies and that's it. And it's all very admirable. But, but to say about Jesus that this death is, is something for the world, how do, how do we make sense of those two things? And that's how I want us to, to try and read the story because I've got this stupid notion that, that actually however we read the story of Jesus, it should make sense as a story. 
what we've done for two, two centuries at least in, in historical criticism is to say, actually it's quite difficult to do looking at the church and the way it tells its story. And so, so let's assume that the story's wrong. <laughs> and I won't say, no, no, perhaps the church is reading it from the wrong place. The church is reading it through the wrong eyes. And actually, the story makes perfect sense if you're under occupation. So let's, let's, let's have a look at how the story unfolds in the last week. I want you to assume that what's going on, and, and I'm offering you th this reading, uh, and, and, and I, I want you to, to, to grapple with it. I'm not saying to you, you've got to read it like this. But does this help m make sense of the story? Does it help make sense of your own faith? Does it help make sense of what it means for us to follow Jesus, not only here where Jesus walked, but when we go back to the UK and, 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 and try and flesh out our own discipleship? What if Jesus gets to Bethany uh, as the leader of an underground movement? In other words, Jesus has been consciously, all throughout his ministry, and because we're here sort of in the middle of it, uh, we haven't kind of got that cumulative sense from the story. But Jesus is resisting empire in the name of <coughs> God. He's resisting Caesar in the name of God, or the emperor in the name of God, and he's resisting the Roman Empire in the name of the kingdom of God. So Jesus is very conscious that he is in confrontation. And he is very conscious of the fact that he is not going to compromise. He's not going to make a deal. He's not going to find a safe space within empire. What, what is a safe space within empire? A safe space in empire is to say that the kingdom of God is all about heaven. It's when you die and you go, you know, you go to heaven. The Romans aren't going to go, oh, we can't have that. That's fine because that leaves the empire untouched. Um, a safe space is saying this is all about my relationship with Jesus it's not about changing the world if all it is is about you and me becoming better people who on earth is going to be offended by that who is actually going to resist that who is going to turn around and say this guy's got to die or this, this woman or this group has got to be stamped out of existence do you see what I'm saying you've got to piss the powers off if you're going to get crucified, the principalities and the powers. You've got to do something that, that if, if, to make them think that you're really dangerous. And that's exactly, of course, the story that we're told. And the question is how and why. So what if Jesus is this underground movement? And he knows, he knows that, 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 that coming to Jerusalem is really dangerous. Why does he know this? He knows because he's got friends in the Sanhedrin who can tell him, do you know what? One of your guys has sold you out. Um, who is it? I'm not sure, but they're talking and, and he's, we've paid him. And you, you watch out Jesus. So Jesus gets to the last supper. He knows he's facing the cross, not for some supernatural woo 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 thing. It's because he knows that, that he's in resistance. So he's here at Bethany where he's safe and and the story that you get of the last week is that this is the place to which he comes every night and then every day he walks into the city and goes up to the temple where he's in the public eye and they can't touch him, right? And they can't touch him because the crowds are going to, to go mad. And they don't know where he goes at night. Hence, they need a Judas who's going to say, I'll, I'll show you where he goes. I'll tell you when it's a good spot, when there's a good spot and a good time to arrest him at night and the people won't know and you won't have a riot on your hands and by the time anybody knows anything it'll be too late and you'll have got rid of him. And he knows that this is a confrontation. Why? Because he's gone, uh, he goes up to the temple every day. This is Jesus taking the fight to the people. He's going to the temple to say, guys, this is why God is going to, to, not only if the kingdom comes, it's going to wipe out the empire, it's also going to wipe out the temple and that whole system because you've sold out and you are no longer what God is, is about.
You are no longer the means of God's salvation. You've become part of, of that which needs sweeping away in order for the kingdom to come. That's how we need to understand Jesus in the fig tree. This is not an incident of the hangry Jesus. You know, hangry? I'm hungry and I'm blooming hacked off about it. Jesus doesn't look at a, a tree and say, why the hell are you not bearing figs even though it's not fig season? You know, Jesus is not petulant. This is a prophetic sign. The fig tree is, is in prophecy and in biblical imagery the picture of Israel. And so the fig tree is not bearing figs. When Jesus appears, it shouldn't matter what season it is, Jesus expects, or God expects, Israel to be ready, and Israel is not. That's the sign of the fig. Okay? So that's, what, that's what's going on there. This is the time, this is the kairos, and the people aren't ready. The first thing, sorry, the first thing he does is he goes into the temple on the first day, and he exorcises it. He doesn't just drive the money changes out. The word that, the word that Mark uses there is he ekbalain, he cast out the money changes. And ekbalain is a technical exorcism word. It's what you do with the demons. So for Jesus, Mark presents Jesus' cleansing of the temple as an exorcism. This is part of the whole system that is ranged against the kingdom. And and you, if, for those of you who are in the webinar and if you've, you've seen the material, and we'll, we'll talk about this when we're done in the Galilee, for Jesus there is no difference between the demons that need casting out of the people and the occupying Roman forces that need casting out of the, out of the holy places, i.e. Israel and the life of the people. They are all part of the same thing. They are occupying forces that have no right under God to be there and which hold people in chains. Think of the Gerasene demoniac, okay? So he casts out the money changers. What's he doing? For him, for Jesus, the temple economy, like the, like the um, Roman, you know, like the rest of the Roman occupation, is contributing to the slavery of the people, not to their liberation. It is contributing to, to, to the things that drive people to despair. It is, it is uh, contributing to the things that, that reduce people to such poverty that they cannot even afford to make the sacrifices that the temple demands. So a salvation economy, the temple, which is about forgiveness, and about God's grace and presence, the Holy of Holies, the sacrificial system, has now been turned into an economy. Come and buy sacrifice. You can't sacrifice unless you pay. And if you, if you can't pay, you can't sacrifice and you can't be forgiven. And of course, for whom is that most difficult? The poorest, the poorest people, the widows, yeah? The widows who now have no one to look after them. And, and after he's cast out these temple, the temple people, one thing to think about with the temple, Jesus is angry. I don't know about you, I, I get really angry when, when, when we hear the stories around here. And I, sometimes I don't know what to do with that, that feeling of anger. Uh, and it's quite encouraging to think that there is such a thing as righteous prophetic anger and it belongs with, with stories of injustice. And one of the things, you know, that we're going to find when we go back and we tell the stories, people are, are, it's a fact that people are going to hear us um, or, or, or be inclined to listen to us if we're not sounding angry. And if we start to sound angry, people are going to go, oh, I think this, is, this person's lost the plot. But Jesus drives them out. And so the temple authorities to say to him, okay, by what authority are you doing this? How dare you come into this house and bring the whole temple economy to a halt? Because that's what Jesus does. Everything has to stop for a day. And he says, you've turned it into a den of robbers and I'm turning it back into what it's supposed to be. All those transactions grind to a halt. The last confrontation that happens in the temple is Jesus is watching a widow. 
It's a widow's mite story, right? Now, I remember the widow's mite story because when I was six, my parents sent me to a Presbyterian Sunday school for the first time, and the first thing I ever did at Sunday school was hear that story and colour in a picture badly. I couldn't stay within the lines. Of, of this woman putting a widow and then we'd sing, hear the pennies dropping, listen why they fall, everyone for Jesus, he shall have them all. And it was all about, here is a woman who has given everything and isn't that what we're supposed to do for God? And, and Jesus has just condemned the, the temple people. You saw it in the verse before. It, you know, you devour widows' houses. And then he watches a poor widow. So I want you to imagine, not Jesus going, oh, isn't that wonderful? That's what Christian stewardship is all about. <laughs> Jesus is sitting opposite the treasury, and it's all public, and he's watching. And all the people come in, and there's a scribe. That was one of the things that scribes wrote. Well, you better go for a turtle dove. How much is the turtle dove? The turtle dove is a farthing. I haven't got a farthing. What do you mean you haven't got a farthing? Said, I haven't got a farthing. I've got a quarter of a farthing. And he says, well, I'm sorry, but you, you, can't, you can't do that. You, you, you can't sacrifice. You, you're not pre prepared to pay anything. She said, but I can't. Go call your husband. I'm a widow. Call your family. I haven't got a family. You mean there's no one who will give you the money for the sacrifice? No one. How much have you got then? Well, I've got this. That's all I've got in the world. He says, well, I suppose we'll just have to be generous and accept it. And Jesus is watching this thinking, do you see what's going on there? The temple, the system is taking the very last thing this woman has in the world and saying that's what God requires of you. And he goes out, they go out, and the, and, and the, the Galilean fishermen are standing where we will, we will go and see, uh, hopefully, um, those stones that make up the platform of Herod's, Herod's temple. And all these Galilean bumpkins are going, wow, Jesus, look at those humongous stones. How do we get there? And Jesus turns around and he says, I'll tell you something. This temple is going. God is going to destroy this because it has lost its reason for being. And it is part of what will be swept away. And that brings us to, to, to perhaps the most difficult chapter in Mark's Gospel, but is the key to Mark's Gospel, which is Mark chapter 13, where Jesus is asked two questions. And Peter said, when is it going to happen and how will we know? And we have turned this, turned Jesus' reply into the sermon that we preach, the text that we use to preach about the end of history and the end of the world. I want you to imagine that this is 69, something like 69 AD, just a year before the Romans are going to invade and smash <coughs> Jerusalem and destroy the temple. So this hasn't happened yet. If that is true, then what is happening is that the Romans are, are pushing down from the Galilee because we're in the middle of the Great Revolt, the biggest revolt, uh, Jewish revolt, against, against Rome right this is when mark is writing and at the time at that time oh sorry this is when jesus is speaking at that time there are there is huge pressure on 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 mark's christian community number one the romans are trying to get some of the christians to sell each other out that's what jesus is talking about when he's talking about brother will betray brother and sister will betray sister the other thing is you've got, you've got Jewish messianic recruiters who are going, I'm the Messiah. No, I'm the Messiah. And the Christians are saying, no, but, but we do not believe in a revolution that is brought about by violent means. And Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation or the desolating sacrilege standing where it is, then you know it's just about to happen. He's referring back to the general Antiochus Epiphanes who had invaded Jerusalem 
centuries before and erected a statue of himself within the Holy of Holies. That's the abomination of desolation. It's a desolating, desolating sacrilege. You're going to see Roman legionaries, Roman stormtroopers on the streets of Jerusalem. And the people are going, no, that can't happen. Jerusalem's inviolable. God is going to protect us. And, and Jesus is effectively saying, no, Jerusalem is not going to survive. And the temple is not going to survive. God is not going to intervene on behalf of, of Jerusalem because of the temple. Because the, 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 the temple is not part of God's, God's plan because it has become corrupt. It has exploited the poor. Head for the hills, literally, Jesus is saying. Because it's going to happen. This whole system is going to be swept away. No wonder they wanted to kill him. They being both the Romans and, and the temple authorities. To declare that the religious system of his day was being swept away is to say that, that something that they did not believe was possible. That it is possible to be the chosen people, to live in God's city, to be part of the whole temple system and be part of that from which the world needs saving. This is part of the stuff that people need saving from. And if that sounds horrific, ask black South Africans about the church, you know? Ask black South Africans about the white church and they would say, this is what we needed saving from. Ask, ask native Latin Americans, you know, from years ago, uh, uh, about the conquistadors and the church. Ask, ask black American slave people and their descendants about the church of the Ku Klux Klan. Ask most of Africa about the slavery system that the UK and others ran for 200 years. They'll tell you, we need saving from these Christians and the church and that kind of Jesus. It is possible to be the church and to be a sign of the kingdom, a sign of the new reality, the new world that Jesus is bringing. It is equally possible to be part of that from which the world needs saving. <laughs>